The weak currency debt structure centers around a loan in Brazilian reals hedged into Canadian dollars via the use of outright forwards rather than a cross-currency swap. The structure permits the borrower to generate reals funding needed for a key strategic objective while increasing the amount of tax deductions the borrower can take on account of the interest it pays and simultaneously reducing the tax it owes on a certain gain it achieves under the structure. The structure takes advantage of the large interest rate differential between the real and the Canadian dollar and would not be feasible in the absence of this differential. The net economic impact of these tax benefits is to reduce the after-tax cost of the financing for the borrower by some 150 basis points or so annually. Our discussion therefore begins on the next slide with a review of the mechanics of FX forwards and cross-currency swaps and the relevant differences between them. We list first a number of assumptions that are used throughout the illustrations and spreadsheets in this module. We assume that Canadian dollar real spot rate is 1.5, that interest rates in real are 12% semi-annually compounded for all maturities, and 4% in Canadian dollars also semi-annually compounded for all maturities and that the day count convention for both currencies is 3360. We also assume that the borrower wishes to borrow 150 million Brazilian reals under a five-year bullet structure, i.e. the equivalent of 100 million Canadian dollars at the spot rate, but also wants to hedge its interest and principal payment obligations under this real debt back into Canadian dollars. In the specific transaction on which this write-up is based, the Canadian domiciled borrower needed reals to pay a dividend in that currency to its Brazilian parent. So the business purpose behind the denomination of the loan in reals was clear and easy to justify. Next, we assume that the borrower is a solid credit that can borrow at the LIBOR or swap rate for all maturities. We ignore, in other words, any credit spread above LIBOR paid by the borrower on account of its credit risk. Finally, we assume a 35% income tax rate under Canadian law. Worksheet forwards reflects the assumptions we just listed. All currency amounts are in units of millions. Column B lists the 10 semi-annual periods over the five-year life of the structure. Columns C and D show the curves in each of the two currencies, assumed, you will recall, to be completely flat but at very different levels in absolute terms. Column E lists the discount factors for the Canadian dollar curve, each of which is derived iteratively from the preceding discount factor using the simple formula appearing, for example, in the cell E7. We could also have shown the discount factors in reals, but in fact we will not be using them. Column F calculates the outright forward rates for each future date using a slight variation of the well-known formula as appears, for example, in this cell F7, 
that combines the spot effects, the two interest rates, and the length of the period in question. You should not be surprised to see such a steep forward curve as the one in this column F. This is directly attributable to the large interest rate differential between the two yield curves which combined with the increasing tenor of each successive forward period causes the Canadian dollar to trade at a higher and higher premium to the real as time increases. This characteristic of the outright forwards is essential to the tax angle underpinning the structure and would disappear if the two curve levels were close. Next, column G lists the cash flows received and paid by the borrower under the loan in Brazilian reals. Inflows are shown as positive numbers while outflows appear as negatives. These cash flows consist simply of the receipt of 150 million reals on day one in this cell G5, followed by the semi-annual interest payments in cells G6 to G15, and followed finally by the repayment of the 150 million real principal in cell G16, simultaneous of course with the last interest payment. Immediately to the right of this column, the two columns H and I list the payments made and received by the borrower under each FX forward contract. Thus, for example, on the same date that the borrower must pay 9 million reals in interest under the loan in this cell G6, the borrower receives this exact amount in reals under the related forward contract and pays an amount in Canadian dollars equal to 5.77 million derived simply by dividing the real amount by the outright forward rate appearing in cell F6. The key column is column I. The diminishing size of the Canadian dollar payments in cells I6 to I15 reflects the pattern of steep successive FX forwards on which we commented previously. And the final payment in this cell I16 relating to the loan's principal repayment on its maturity date is of course much larger than the individual interest payments but substantially smaller than the original amount of the loan which in Canadian dollar terms equaled 100 million given the spot rate on day one. The use of outright forwards to hedge the liability back into Canadian dollars has arguably eliminated the borrower's FX exposure assuming his revenues are in Canadian dollars but still looks very different from the cash flows the borrower would be facing if he had issued a Canadian dollar fixed rate bond directly. A direct bond issue would have required payment of smaller cash flows on interest payment dates and ones exactly equal to each other and a substantially larger cash flow on the maturity date namely a hundred million Canadian dollars not counting the final coupon. You should keep this point clearly in your head when we next compare these Canadian dollar cash flows to those under a cross-currency swap, the difference being central to the tax benefits under the structure.
Worksheet Swap lays out the full set of cash flows under the cross-currency swap alternative. Columns B, C, D, E, and F continue to show period numbers, yield curves, discount factors, and loan cash flows exactly as before. Also, the cash flows under the swap received by the borrower in reals are unchanged from the preceding worksheet since these must continue to match exactly the payments due under the loan. What is different are the cash flows paid in Canadian dollars by the borrower under the swap. In contrast to the uneven pattern that appeared on the earlier worksheet which reflected the uneven outright forward rates for each future date, the cross-currency swap cash flows are smoothed out under the swap structure so that they replicate exactly the cash flows the borrower would have incurred under a direct issue of a Canadian dollar fixed rate bond at 4%. The smaller payments made on interest payment dates are offset by the larger payment on the maturity date. And for the swap to be correctly priced, ignoring the dealer's profit margin, the PV of the savings achieved by the borrower on the interest payment dates must equal exactly the PV of the amount by which the 100 million Canadian dollars paid on the maturity date of the cross-currency swap exceeds the smaller amount of 68 million Canadian dollars it pays under the outright forwards on that date. Stated another way, columns I and J should have exactly the same PV, assuming the outright forwards and the cross-currency swap alternatives are priced at zero profit to the dealer. We suggest you click the pause button here for a second or two and confirm this to your satisfaction. The solution will be provided as soon as you click the play button again. Worksheet Swap Valuation confirms the equivalence in PV terms of the two alternatives. Set forth in column K are the differences between the cash flows in columns I and J. Immediately to the right in column L we have listed the PV of each difference using the Canadian dollar discount factors from column E and at the bottom of this column in cell L17 we show the sum of all entries above it in that column. The zero value confirming the equivalence in PV terms that we anticipated. Another reality that follows from this equivalence, which we illustrate on this next worksheet labeled IRR, is that the IRRs of the cash flows in Canadian dollars from the borrower's perspective under the two structures are exactly equal, as can be seen from comparing the IRR appearing in cells J19 and J20. We should first explain that the insertion into this worksheet of columns J and L 
was rendered necessary to enable the IRR calculation since in column I and column K the last two entries occur on the same date exactly even though they appear in successive cells. The 4% appearing in both cells for the IRRs should not surprise you since we stated initially that the borrower can borrow at the swap rate in either currency and since we have included zero profit margin for the dealer. The next observation is critical to the tax angle in this transaction. While the IRRs under the two alternatives are equal, the size of the individual cash flows on each payment date differs significantly giving rise to quite different tax consequences. One, the amount of interest deductions the borrower takes on each interest payment date will be different under each structure. Specifically, these deductions will be larger under the outright forward structure than under the cross-currency swap. And two, more importantly, on the maturity date, the borrower under the cross-currency swap is deemed to be repaying the principal he borrowed originally, no more nor less. Since this amount in cell K16 equals exactly the amount originally borrowed in Canadian dollar equivalent terms. While under the outright forwards, the borrower is deemed to achieve a taxable gain on the date of final payment since he is repaying quote-unquote only 68 million Canadian dollars having borrowed five years earlier the substantially larger sum of a hundred million Canadian equivalent dollars. We therefore spend a few minutes discussing the tax treatment of deductions and gains before turning to the detailed analysis of the specific tax benefit under the structure. Tax deductions represent essentially a transfer of wealth from the government to the taxpaying entity. To best understand the value of a tax deduction, consider two companies, A and B, that have earned $100 of profits before interest expenses but now must pay interest on their outstanding debts which aggregate $1,000 in both cases. Company A is an excellent credit that pays only 3% interest on its debt but in a jurisdiction in which interest payments are not tax deductible. Company B is an inferior credit paying 5% interest on its debt but in a jurisdiction in which interest is tax deductible. Both jurisdictions charge income tax at 40% of net profits. Since for company A interest payments are not tax deductible the 40% income tax is applied to the entire $100 of profits, leaving $60 in the hands of the company. From this, the company now pays $30 in interest on its debt, 
and is left with $30 in after-interest, after-tax profits, which of course it can either retain or distribute to shareholders. In the case of Company B, for which interest is tax deductible, the 40% income tax is calculated only after deducting from the $100 profit figure the company's interest payments on its debt. This being 5% on $1,000 or $50 leaves the company with $50 before tax on which the income tax is now applied leaving once again $30 the company can retain or distribute. The deductibility of the interest payment in the case of Company B has meant in effect that its after-tax interest cost is only 3%, the same as that of Company A. The other 2% received by its creditors in effect coming out of the pocket of the government. More generally, if the marginal income tax rate is T, and the pre-tax cost of debt is KD, then the after-tax cost of this debt equals KD times 1 minus T, an observation familiar to anyone with basic knowledge of corporate finance. We also speak of the tax shield, quote-unquote, of debt as having a value of KD times T in this instance. you are probably beginning to anticipate that the larger Canadian dollar cash outflows on the interest payment dates under the outright forwards increase the value of the tax shield for the borrower and you would be right. The exact calculation of this increased benefit will be undertaken shortly but first we must turn our attention to the treatment of the apparent gain the borrower achieves on the maturity date, specifically when repaying only 68 million Canadian dollars versus the 100 million it borrowed initially. It is here that the key benefit of the structure appears. For in common with most other jurisdictions around the world, Canada recognizes certain forms of gains as so-called capital gains rather than so-called ordinary income and exempts from taxation some specified percentage of these gains. Gains from selling an equity security at a price higher than the purchase price or gains from repurchasing debt at a price lower than the price at which it was issued are two forms of gains that are treated as capital gains in many countries, benefiting typically from substantial exemption from tax. In our specific structure, the repayment of principal in the amount of 68 million Canadian dollar only is treated under Canadian tax law as representing a gain of 32 million Canadian dollars for the borrower, but specifically a capital gain and one that is 50% exempt from tax under current legislation. So in the year in which the maturity date of the debt and the swap occurs, the borrower will pay to the Canadian tax authority on account of this deemed gain, a tax equal to 100 million minus 68 million times 50 percent times the borrower's marginal tax rate. A burden, no doubt, but only half the burden that would arise but for the 50 percent exemption. 
Worksheet After Tax IRR is our next worksheet and permits us to calculate with precision the cost savings achieved under the structure by the borrower. We remind you that a 35% income tax rate is assumed in this worksheet. Columns B to J are simply reproduced from the preceding worksheet and require no further explanation. In column K, cells K6 to K15 list the value of the tax shield for the borrower using the formula we showed a little earlier for calculating this tax shield. Cell K16 conversely calculates the tax payable by the borrower on account of the capital gain achieved from repaying a lesser amount of principal than it had borrowed. Note in this formula the 35% domestic income tax rate via the cross-reference to cell F21, the 50% exemption applicable to capital gains via the cross-reference to cell F22, and finally the derivation of the amount of the gain as simply the difference between the amount borrowed and the amount repaid. Continuing with this worksheet, column M permits us to incorporate the tax effects and to determine the true cost after tax under the outright forward alternative. Quite simply, this column reduces the entries in column I by the tax shield on each interest payment date, the plus sign being necessary since outflows are shown as negatives in this worksheet. But conversely, this column increases the last entry by the payment of the capital gains tax on the maturity date. Then cell 019 calculates the IRR of the after-tax cash flow under this column for the forward structure revealing it to be 1.24 percent. This needs finally to be compared to the after-tax cost if the borrower had used an ordinary cross-currency swap rather than outright forwards. Column O lists the after-tax cash flows under the cross-currency swap for which cell O20 derives an IRR of 2.6%. In summary, an after-tax savings of 136 basis points annually has been achieved. It bears emphasizing that virtually all of the after-tax savings stemmed entirely from the tax exemption on 50% of the capital gain realized on the debt's repayment date. This is easily confirmed by replacing the 50% entry in cell F22 with zero and noting the increase in the after-tax IRR in cell O19 to 2.45% i.e. only 15 basis points less than that for the cross-currency swap. These remaining 15 basis points are due to timing differences 
in the tax effects under the two alternatives. We complete this video by reflecting on a number of real-life differences between the simplified transaction we have described and the ones you are likely to see in practice, and by saying a few words on transaction replicability. First, our description has ignored a number of small but not insignificant additional costs that arose in the real transaction. Upfront arrangement fees and certain so-called CPFM charges under Brazilian law. Also, the real transaction involved an amortizing rather than a bullet loan and granted the borrower prepayment rights that we have ignored. The above alter slightly the final result but do not change the essence of the transaction. We also note that Canadian tax law, like that of many other countries, contains nowadays a so-called general anti-avoidance rule or GAR which permits the tax authorities to deny tax benefits on transactions that are principally motivated by their tax treatment. It has always been difficult to define exactly how far such anti-avoidance rules extend and in what exact circumstances. But it suffices to explain that in the specific transaction on which this video is based, the need for reals to pay a dividend to the borrower's parent in Brazil was deemed a sufficiently legitimate business purpose as to place the structure outside the scope of the GAR. Presumably the same would apply if the Canadian borrower needed reals to purchase aircraft or other equipment from Brazil or to invest in the stock of a Brazilian supplier or for various other purposes. In all cases however the opinion of qualified tax specialists must be sought to achieve the necessary comfort on this question. With regard to transaction replicability there is nothing limiting replicability to debts issued specifically in real. But the tax savings diminish as we migrate towards lower yielding alternatives and are eliminated altogether if interest rates in the second currency are lower than in Canadian dollars. Similarly, there is nothing sacred about a five-year maturity. In fact, the longer the debt's maturity, the better, since the longer the maturity, the greater the number of interest payments made over the life of the instruments, the cash flows that generate the increased tax deductions. And also, the longer the maturity, the further away the last outright forward rate will lie relative to the spot and therefore the greater the capital gain at maturity on which the 50% tax exemption is allowed. We illustrate this on worksheet long on which we model a 10-year structure rather than one maturing in five years but now using annual interest payments instead of semi-annual ones to keep the worksheet to a manageable size. A dramatic improvement is noted in this cell I-20 which reveals this time an IRR of negative 2.54 percent representing almost a 500 basis point annualized savings after tax. This concludes this video.